Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to have Felipe Narde here, and he's going to be talking about uh, doing some pretty crazy things in Zoom. <laughs> so building events inside of Zoom. So he's going to be talking about that in the second hour. So stay tuned. And now let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? Mike Edwards starts us off this morning from Brooklyn, New York. He says, morning, guys. I've heard some CDNs, uh, content distribution networks, charge a huge bill for going over your monthly two terabyte data limit. And he has in parentheses, cough, Vimeo, for building a private, private video library open to members. Which CDN would you choose? Vimeo, AWS, Bunny.net, or Wistia, and why? I think you have to decide on what level of control you need um, and and how much you're going to pay for it. I mean, you're going to pay for for bandwidth. So so that's the that's the issue. I mean, if you don't want to pay for bandwidth, you can use things like them. I mean, uh, like YouTube. You know, you can put everything. There are some companies that just put everything on YouTube. They make it maybe they make it unlisted and then they put it all in. It just depends on how secure you need it to be. As soon as you decide you want it to be secure and you're not you don't want to have ads run against it and all the other things that are, that come with that, you have to now start to budget for those things. Those prices have gone down a lot, but they're still there. I think it's about um I, I think that the, the the ballpark number is six to eight cents a gigabyte. You know, so so you just have to um you just have to kind of think through what that means for how many members you have and how big your your uh, your library is, um, but there's always if you're not going to put it on a free service, there's always going to be a cost to um, making that available. Now, some people also hack through it with things like uh, Dropbox and other things like that, um, but it can get um, it, it, you know again if you if you're going to move a lot of stuff, you just have to figure out who's going to pay for that. Um, but that's a, usually a constant constant problem. Now, next question. Next one comes to some guy Cochran in Seattle, and he says, who would be your dream guest for a highly attended office hours second hour? Go ahead, Mitchell. Can we, you didn't say who, it could be anybody. Uh, dream guest, Elon Musk would be the man of the hour. <laughs> Yeah, that would be that. We definitely get a lot of people would show up for that. I don't know. I don't. We'd have to see if uh, if McConaughey could handle uh, that that level of of uh, of action there. Um, you know, I think that. I mean, there's definitely folks that that I think would be a lot of fun to to bring on. Um, I'm trying to think of dream guests. I mean, I think that I I, I don't want to spoil the ones that I'm working on. So, but but I think that uh, we we have some pretty big guests that that we can bring on. Um, we just are waiting for uh, the right time. So, so anyway, so stay, stay tuned for that. I, I think that uh, it, it really just is a function of how many people are showing up every morning. When we say we have, oh, we've got a couple hundred people that show up every morning, we get a certain uh, amount of interest. So if we had a couple thousand or more, we would have more interest. <laughs> so, so I think that uh, it's, it's a progressive thing. Um, but I think that we could, you know, do a get at some point, we could get almost, <clears throat> excuse me, almost anyone. Uh, next question. Uh, next one comes from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York again. He says, morning, guys. Alex, why did you choose MailChimp as the official office hours mailer as opposed to the other offerings out there and the pros and cons of MailChimp? That's because I know it. <laughs> I've used MailChimp on and off for a decade or so, and, and I just I just know what it does. Um, and and again, it's it's not – I'm, I'm not particularly enamored by it. It's just that I, I kind of know where – most of the bits and pieces are. Um, I find that uh, whatever it starts with, its its base setup is painfully and just ugly. They, I think they do that on purpose to make sure that you do some updates or something. But you can always tell when someone just opens up Mailchimp and sends something out because it looks horrible. And I've done it too. And um, and so you really have to get in there and start to work on it. But it does have um, an incredible amount of control as far as campaigns. It can be tied into lots of things. It can be pulling those emails in, like when people sign up on officehours.global, it automatically adds to a list in MailChimp, which is, you know, and everything in those kind, there's a thousand examples of that that are built in. It's probably the most mature um, system out there. Go ahead, John. So I was, I was in the email business before and, and MailChimp did a very good job. They're the zoom of the mail business. They made things super easy to create a list and send out to their list for, for free. Mostly if your list was under you know, 500 people, you could do it all for free. So they did a good job and hence into it, buying them for $15 billion. So who bought them? Into it. Oh, into it. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah go ahead, Mitchell. One of the considerations now when you're picking a uh, mail service is how sensitive that service is to uh, getting dropped into a spam folder, like 
uh, Constant Contact or MailChimp, they're both pretty sensitive, and if you uh, exceed a certain level, they will flag you. Yep, yeah, and and we do definitely, uh, you know, we we have we we do get uh, some of them going into mail. We, more of them came in after we switched over. More people got it. It goes into mail, and that's just kind of the nature of. Uh, I used to manage a. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't. I think we might have used Mailchimp back then. As I mean, I, I can't remember, but. Uh, my list, my list for DB Garage was about seventy thousand, and it wasn't wasn't it wasn't massive, not a massive list, but it was, but it's all a list that we personally acquired. So we didn't, you know, buy lists, we didn't rent things, we just we just did things on the website that asked you for your email, and um and uh, and so the uh, and that was I will say that mailing lists once they get to fifty thousand or above can be super useful if you use them well. Um, the main thing about any mailing list is that every email needs to be a service, you know, like, so we provide a service of telling you what's happening here. Um, we, we'll do better and make it even more interesting over time. Um, but when we sent out emails from like DB Garage, we never sent out anything that didn't come with a great value. You know, you're getting something a lot less. It's something I learned. I used to do snail mail lists <laughs> for Sony Music. And, um, and, uh, People would want that list. They desperately wanted the list because it was probably the most powerful list in where I where I worked um, in Pittsburgh and um, for music. And you, I could fill any locate. I could fill any location under about seven hundred people. Um, you know, uh, uh, at any at a given time. But what I did to make that happen was I made sure that you never. Someone wanted to send out a little sale for their record store or something like that, and I would do it. But they had to give me at least thirty percent off something that that people actually wanted. Like I looked at it as the from a user's perspective. And I want to make sure that when you open that, you're like, oh, what's going on? There? Like there's something magical there that I'm going to get. Not that, oh, this is just another spam that's going to give me, you know, or, or it's some kind of junky whatever. I wanted to make sure that you opened it every, t every single time you were excited to get that. You wanted to see that postcard in the mail. And that's, that's the way to make all these mailing lists work. Next question. Next one comes from Guy Cochran in Seattle. He says, greetings from Zoomtopia, San Jose. Smells like something big might be brewing. Will you be paying attention today? We will have well, we'll have a watch party. Um, uh, we will have a watch party at nine thirty for the product uh, um, product keynote. Um, I have a feeling there's some there's some zany stuff uh, that's going to be talked about there, and I, I think that the video production might be some some of the video production might be kind of fun. Uh, go ahead, Serge. I'm going to ask Guy uh, something big. <laughs> do you see? Do you hear anything? Is it something that we should be aware? I'm probably too close to it to talk about it, but but um, but uh, I I think we should just wait until nine thirty. Go ahead, Mitchell. Is it possible there's a Starbucks nearby? Starbucks. <laughs> I don't I don't understand. Um. Anyway, go ahead, now, Bill. I just uh, am pointing out that it, apparently the team will be here on Thursday. So if you're interested in after whatever announcements come out, if you're interested in digging down into what they're about. Put Thursday on your calendar. Yeah, it's going to be, I think Thursday is going to be exciting. And I think that Zoom, I mean, we, we, we saw some really incredible things at IBC, um, but, but Zoom Topia is really their, their conference. And so I think that we'll end up seeing a lot of uh, great stuff. Do let me know if you're, if you're watching right now. I'm not sure who's all in San Jose. I know guys here, um, but I'm not sure who else uh, came in. So let us know. Go ahead, John. The keynote starts at nine though, right, Alex? Is it nine? I thought it was nine thirty. Yeah, nine. nine. So right after this, we'll come right out of this and go right into that. Um, we have question. a room in after hours or something like that. If we go, yeah, we're going to go into after hours and 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 watch it in, in okay. after hours. So we're not going to watch it. It's a second year experience, so we all have to get in and watch. You know, get into after hours and then watch the. And you did have to sign up. It was simple and it cost free, but you had to sign up for Zoomtopia to get the link for it. So you might want to explore that right now if you're interested in afterwards. Next question. Next question comes to us from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona, asking for friends, what satellite-based internet have you used other than Starlink, and would you recommend for use in Eastern Europe? Go ahead, Mitchell. Back uh, in the early 90s, I used HughesNet, and the only com problem that I had with it is the latency. When you, when you send a request, it just takes two to three seconds to get a response. Uh, the only thing I've used in uh, Europe has been a satellite truck, KU, satellite truck, and then you put... You have, you have to put the um, bandwidth encoders onto it um, to to make to get you bandwidth out of it. Um, I did it specifically in southern Turkey. <laughs> so for an event that was you know 
near Southern Turkey. Um, anyway, so um, the uh, but but we use the KU uplink for for that, and that's the only thing I've used to, to make that work. It's not the cheapest solution. It's good for we only had to be uh, on and for about eight minutes. So so it was uh, it was not something I would use in the back of a camper. Uh, also, you can also research things like KA. Uh, KA uplinks um, for for internet are are going to be good as long as it's not too cloudy or rainy. Now the KA is a very high uh, frequency bandwidth and or high frequency wavelength, and so it's uh, it's not going to get through. It's not going to cut through um, uh, things like heavy clouds and fog as well as a KU or a C band. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Matt Woods in Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK, looking for a plug and play solution for good quality wired audio input to an iPad for online meetings, likely to be in environments with background noise. So possibly looking for a headset solution. Any suggestions? Go ahead, Mitchell. Love that uh, TC Helicon goes solo. It's a small device, has headphones out and uh, plugs right into your iPad if it's got a USB. I think it's looking for an audio input into the iPad. That's what um, it does. Online meeting. It does audio. So you're, yeah. it has a mic input. And it does have a side tone. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. We talk a good little bit about the Ceremonic units, and they work just fine. I will say be uh, prepared for that. If you buy Lightning Now, a Lightning interface, and most of the iPads out there use Lightning interfaces, know that they are switching with the new Pros to USB-C, which is going to open up a whole new world, I believe, of higher quality XLR audio adapters, because there's a lot of stuff out there that the higher bandwidth of USB-C supports. So uh, just pay attention to that. Yeah, the only thing that I've really used to get in and out of an iPad, I know this is not going to be the cost effective way to go, but um, I've, it's a lightning to USB and lightning. So it's a lightning out and it has a USB and a lightning. So you can take power from the lightning to go back into uh, the iPad and then you have an, a USB connection. And then I hook that USB connection into a USB interface. That USB interface for me is a, is a USB Pre 2, um, but that's as expensive as the iPad. But it is truly plug and play. You know, like it is, it is like you plug it in. There's no uh, software. That, it doesn't have to figure anything out. You just plug it in and it does the thing. Um, and it passes you audio and it's uh, got limiters and, you know, all kinds of other stuff in it. So it's, it's really uh, useful. But once you get out of that, once you get to the USB, um, whether it's a USB-C or a USB, you should be able to do things like a, a, a mix pre as well if you wanted to. If you want to have noise assist, for instance, uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Alex, is that the sound devices? Uh, yeah, USB unit? pre too is the sound devices. And it's... Uh, Still use them. We still we still use them. Uh, they are they have not been updated <laughs> for a decade, um, but they are you know they are controlled. You change the settings by flipping dip switches on the back, um, and it is uh, it, it is just a tank. Um, you know, um, so it's it's pretty pretty useful. Next question. Keenan Campbell in Nevada in the USA says, for those that are independent consultants, what native Mac OS apps do you use for time tracking and billing? Pros and cons uh, recommendations. Go ahead, Serge. I don't have a native uh, macOS app, but I have a website. It's Freshdesk. I use it to, uh, in the past, to have tickets and have time attached to these tickets. For, so then the billing is pretty simple. That's my recommendation. I do everything I can to not charge by the hour. So I don't have to time track my time. <laughs> so like everything I can. All right. Uh, next question. Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida asks, which magazines, blogs, YouTube channels, and so forth, do you monitor for the latest audio, video, and IP tech? Good, Serge. Well, of course, of a bit of the last 10 years, I still go to Engage and Gadget. Um, don't know why. But mostly nowadays, uh, Google News and Apple News would give me all the tech news I need. Good, Javier. Yeah, uh, what I found is like now that Twitter is like this, people going get in and out, going in. If you have a well created Twitter feed, it's a great source of information. So I just like follow people that I see like in panels or like they're like uh, using stuff and I try to keep up with them. So I, a good uh, curated Twitter feed is the best source of news for me. Good, Mitchell. I like Mac OS rumors spelled with a U. It's an excellent source for Mac stuff. I think I get most of my AV uh, information from here. <laughs> you know, it's within our Discord and within uh, our talking and people bringing stuff up here. I think I probably discover the most things uh, within office hours. Um, I do see a couple things on Twitter. I don't think I'd see a lot. I mean, other than that, I'm, I have a pretty well-tuned uh, well 
Flipboard. I still use Flipboard, which is very, very old, but it's um, but mine knows what I want, and the, most of the product announcements show up there. So, so I think that um, that that's been pretty useful. And then, of course, Apple News, um, and then the notes that I have for MacBrick <laughs> that come up because I get there's a there's a much larger list than what we talk about on the show that that is there that we might talk about on the show, and so that you know every week kind of is a uh, a collection an omnibus of of everything I probably should be keeping up with, and then. A variety of Discord channels and, and email lists. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Keenan Campbell in Nevada again. Can we do a second hour where we focus on our community members that run businesses that support office hours, kind of like a small business Saturday, but for our friends? Sounds great. Talk to Josh. <laughs> let's let's figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question. Harshi Dreddy, Daytona Beach, Florida. Any suggested door jam stoppers or some sort of material to cancel sound bleed from the other side of the door? Go ahead, Mitchell. Just keep in mind that a one inch gap on a wall or a floor or in a doorway in a door jam uh, will pass all the sound that it wants to. So they make these little uh, socks almost that slip over the bottom of your door jam and it's kind of a U-shaped device that uh, kind of grips it. And uh, that'll, because it's foam and squishy, uh, it'll block that uh, spot out. Good, Bill. We used to use a thing called a door sweep. I put them on most of the places that I've had to do audio recording. And it's a metal bar, usually uh, 36 inches or 32. I think doors come traditionally in the U.S. in 32 and 36. And what it is is a metal thing that has a little button on one end. And you put the button, you, you screw it into the bottom of the door. You keep it about... Um, a quarter or a little more inch from the actual carpet or floor surface. And when the door closes and that jam shuts, it pushes a button and drops down a rubberized sound seal. And on almost all the voice booths I've ever had, we've had something like that in it to make sure that we try to eliminate the maximum amount of things. So there, you know, that's one of the things for doors that and switching away from hollow core doors to solid core doors can do a pretty good job of uh, of doing something if you don't want a commercial voice booth door, which are hugely heavy and very complex to install. When we're dealing with mo a mobile situation, a lot of times we show up at a location that just needs to be, you know, we have to knock out a door and the sound coming through a door. Um, we put sound blankets on either side of the door. So basically we press them up, we, we put them on a frame and then set them against the, on both sides of the door. And we try to build a, not quite a seal, but a, but close to a seal. It's not gonna be perfect, but it does definitely, you create a lot of um, softness and if it has crown molding, it will have a, an, an inch on either side of that. And it really drops it probably by about 40 dB, you know? Um, so if we need to, you know, knock something out um, and to get, you know, it, it's not going to handle, you know, lawnmowers, <laughs> but, but for, you know, just general um, ambient sound that was coming through the door. a lot of times it's pretty effective. Next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. And he says the Yamaha MODX plus uses unbalanced inputs and outputs. If I wanted to run a balanced signal into a mod X input, would a box like the radial J ISO, and he's got a link there, be useful to ensure optimum levels and low noise? Mitchell. Yeah, that would work. And, uh, and a lot of DI boxes out there and they could be passive. And what a passive DI box will do is it'll place a transformer between the balanced and the unbalanced uh, output because you need that electrical isolation between them. Um, also, a uh, electronically balanced device like from Henry uh, will work well also. Yeah, um, I carry a variety of things that will convert um, uh, unbalanced to balanced. Uh, and things like like what what was just talked about. I will never design a system around unbalanced audio ever, ever. Like it is a emergency that like oh we showed up and something broke or someone didn't have anything. But never ever ever design any part of your workflow, not one device with a with an unbalanced output. Like just just don't you know don't 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 do that. Like it's just it's, it's not good design. Um, it's you know you you you. The, when I hear a buzz, I'm, I'll be in the back of a big event and I'll hear a buzz somewhere. And all I do, and literally all I do is I look for the person with an unbalanced connection. Like I just walk down the, walk down the thing. It's usually the person with, you know, <laughs> with presenter pro or, or, or something like, or, or, uh, or playback pro or whatever. And they've got their little DI box there. And as soon as I unplug it, all the, all the buzz goes away. It's just, it is, it, it is a, it's the, it's the devil. 
Um, next question. Andy Kokendorfer in VR Florida is up next. He says, has there been any discussion of webcam and or mic app privacy? For example, the Insta360 privacy policy allows them, quote, the right to collect and use your personal information without your consent, close quote. You know, I don't know. That's yeah, it's a good point. I, I, it's probably something that we should look at. I'm really excited about the link, but uh, yeah, we should we should see what that is. I, I will say with the link itself, um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting, and, and I admit, I don't think about the privacy that much with the link because of the way I use it, which is that I only use it for events. So they sit unplugged <laughs> like here, and I simply, uh, um, uh, I just plug them in when I need them, and I'm not too worried about when I'm, whatever they're plugged in, I'm probably doing something pretty public. Uh, the... The interesting thing about the link that I did think was it, when it, talk, it talks about privacy, but the first thing the link does when you when you stop using it is it points up. It just immediately just goes, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to look away from you um, immediately. Uh, and then when you turn it back on, when it get when it's, when an app grabs it, it comes back down and looks looks where it, where it was before. Go ahead, Serge. What I'm wondering, Alex, is uh, you have more experience than me with the that camera. Can you use it without the software? Because I imagine that privacy policy is only applying if you use that software, because using just the USB protocol, it would not then play anything. I think you can. It, it, I think you control with you can have a UVC control. You just won't have all the controls that you had before. And I think that you know a lot of times if you dig into the privacy policy. Um, a lot of times the lawyers within within the company, you, you know, they may be collecting things and we should definitely look and we should pay attention to what's actually happening because it could be nefarious. Um, so it's, it's definitely a valid concern. Um, most of the time what happens is lawyers just put in this big wide, like no one's reading these and I'm just going to put in a big wide right so that I don't have, I, I'm just going to open up a right of way so I don't have to think about it later. <laughs> you know, so, so I, you know, so it doesn't necessarily mean they're doing anything as, as, as opposed to the lawyers just saying, well, we can do whatever we want and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to ask um, there. And so it, 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 I, I'd be surprised because obviously it would destroy their market if it ever came out that they were doing anything with our, you know, anything with the actual content. You know, they may be trying to get data around, um, you know, they might be, you know, when you sign up, when you look, they can, you know, collect, you know, I, if they were actually doing stuff with the content, it would probably destroy their market. So, it, 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 I mean, destroy the company. So there is a, a level of physics there that, that they have to kind of get over to. Um, next question. Next one comes from Serge Monton and Montreal, Canada here on the panel. Uh, speaking in After Hours about taking pictures of the blood moon, not representing what we experience in real life. Will a high quality VR be able to better give that experience? What do you mean by high quality VR? It's because we were talking about the fact that when you watch something like that, you are able to focus anywhere around you and have a, your eyes to do the perfect job. VR is not at that point yet because the VR, the image quality that we get is the problem. The, yeah. the, we, our brain knows that it's represented. It's not the real representation. Yeah. I mean, VR does not do well with small objects because you're seeing it's taking 180 degrees and putting it in a very small box. And so um, we've definitely found we've done VR related to things like the eclipse. We did, we did some VR stuff with uh, the last eclipse that came over the US. Um, and, um, and it was, uh, you know, not <laughs> underwhelming because <laughs> you know, like, it's just like tiny little dot that's way up in the distance. And, it, you know, it, it was much more impressive in person, like when you're looking at it through sunglasses um it was much more impressive to to look at than than uh you know, not sunglasses but you know the blockers or whatever that they that they made but yeah it's a little it, it wasn't that impressive to, to do it otherwise yeah go ahead bill i was going to note i get into this conversation a little bit and i was on um the san diego reddit group yesterday and somebody posted this really nice picture of the uh, looking west from the beach in san diego beautiful sand beautiful water beautiful sky and People were piling on that fellow a little bit for, well, you know, there's so much AI and things like that that it's not really hard to take a picture like that. And I kind of got a little grumpy and I, I kind of stepped up and they said, well, what filters did you use and did you manipulate it or not? And I started thinking about the fact that there's two different kind of ways you can approach image making. You can take pictures or you can make pictures. And I think they're both valid. I can see the purpose of saying, did, is that what actually happened when you click the shutter and have you manipulated it at all? 
I can also see the validity of the other side, which is we have these fabulous tools that enhance the sky and do other things. And sometimes you can make something that really looks more beautiful, for lack of a better phrase for it, uh, through manipulation. And that is your choice. That's your artistic input into the photo. So I guess what I'm saying is that it's the same thing with VR here in this question. Um, you can argue that you can manipulate this VR experience such that it's better than real life, that that's better than what you would see looking at it. But Maybe, is it? I, I don't, I just don't know. I don't, I don't think VR is there yet. I mean, as, as Serge kind of laid out, I don't think, I think you're still going to want to generally to see the detail, you're going to want to have a telephoto lens. <laughs> I wouldn't figure out the framing. Uh, if I was going to take pictures of it, I would be trying to take pictures of the moon and get something that I can't get when I'm just standing there. Uh, go ahead, Serge. Like VR with infinite zoom, <laughs> like the, the possibility yeah. to have VR, but to yeah. say that point, I want to zoom and yeah. not lose any quality. Yes, yes, that would be great. <laughs> so where's where's the Lytro camera? When we need? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, next question. Uh, Chris Weiner in Lafayette, Indiana. Okay, I have a project slipping sideways, and we have a low-budget project with three borrowed cars, but now one of the owners doesn't want anyone else to drive his car. We have access to a disused railroad siding uh, uh, to make a big tracking shot. Um, I don't know how you would do a... I don't quite understand... Um, maybe Chris, you can ask that question again. I just don't understand what the disused railroad siding cons is that cars to do a big tracking. Yeah, I got lost a little there too because it didn't make sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not totally certain what you're trying to do there. If you're trying to track it with a big, the, the big problem you have is micro vibrations. You'd be better off. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I guess is, is that what you're using that car oh, for? Oh yeah, do they want to use the railroad tracks as a big dolly? That would be weird. Uh, it just it depends on if you have some kind of stabilizer, a gimbal that's going to stabilize. It's the micro, you know, it's not built for that, so it's not very, it's not going to be very smooth um, to uh, to make that work. Um, but yeah, you might want to ask another question there. I'm not totally certain of what you what you're doing there. And for our uh, our our producers, uh, we are just cutting through these questions like a hot knife through butter. <laughs> I've actually done that once just because I had to see it. And it's amazing. Like the, the it, it melts the butter as it, if you get it red hot. I did it when I was a kid because I was like, what is this hot knife through butter? And it bubbles as you go through it. It's going so fast. And that's how fast we're going through these questions. So uh, if you've got more questions, you go ahead and throw them up. There's a lot of good, a lot of good, a uh, lot of good knowledge here. All right. Next question. Oh, Javier, before we, before we move. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was like reading again the, the question of the train track. So I'm not I'm not sure if maybe he wants to instead of someone driving the car, like putting on the train car train tracks and rig it somewhere like to move it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if he doesn't want someone driving the car. I'm not sure he's going to be good with someone like rigging stuff and putting on train tracks and doing so. Right. I will I will try to fix it editorially, like try to shoot it a different way. Mm -hmm. Maybe he can drive it from long shots and in the close ups we can push the car or try to do it uh, some way that it works for the for the video but you don't have to like resolve to this weird uh, like trying to rig the car to a train track right next question next one comes from douglas carmichael again the nbc news studio fly through video and he's got a link to it there looks like it was shot with a drone because of the smooth flight wouldn't using a drone in indoor areas run the risk of injury and or damage because of propeller strikes uh, yeah, the drones that often are used in inside have cages around them, so that and you can even get them for some of the other ones where they have little cages that go around the the uh, the actual blades, and they're they're used more and more. This one does look like it would be very hard to do. I was thinking maybe they might be using a Steadicam, but uh, this one would be yeah impossible. They, they definitely used a drone, um, and uh, yeah, so there's little ones there. They also FP, uh, you know the. Um, FPVs uh, are also, um, you know, can go through a lot of really detailed spaces um, without too much trouble. And again, they're the the generally the, the propellers are protected. It protects the pe propellers as well as the, as well as the stuff around it. And they and I've had a couple of those and run them into lots of things. and They don't do any damage. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. What about using a wire cam? Not for that. If you look at the video, I mean, they're all over the place. There's the, A drone would be the only way to shoot that. Um, it's pretty impressive, actually. Good, Bill. 
Yeah. And if you don't remember about a year ago, uh, a gentleman in Minnesota was Minneapolis. I can't remember, did a bowling alley shoot uh, through the drone and it was just magical. And it really blew up on YouTube. Everybody was watching it for a while. If you do uh, on YouTube an Indi Indianapolis drone bowling alley, you'll find it. It's astonishing what those pilots are able to accomplish with shots. I also think though, that the propellers on most drones, particularly the lightweight ones are kind of designed not to damage people tremendously. You still have to be careful on, I think they did it indoor because it's private property, they can control it, but that's, those shots are amazing now that they're getting. Javier. Yeah, I'm thinking of FPV drones that Alex mentioned. DJI launched a couple of months ago the Avata. That's like a very small, very user friendly. It's not for FPV heavy users, but you can use it indoors. I have a friend who has a drone pilot that has done some videos in his living room, in his backyard. So it's like extremely simple to use. And what, what, what Bill said, if it uh, hits something, it's made so it doesn't damage. So it's like not so fast. It, the, the propellers are uh, protected. So it's a great starting point even for uh, beginners and the other thing to look at is that they it's not clear whether they did that what a lot of times we've done with some of this is to um we take it slower and then speed it up so it may not be going as fast as it looks when you see it there it looks like it's just racing through nbc but they probably shot it at half that speed um you know or less um and kind of moved it moved it through there and so um one of the things to think about by the way if you do that is since we have a little time <laughs> is is to think about your shutter speed so if you go half the speed um you want to have your shutter speed be half as well because so like they're twice you have your shutter speed be twice for half so if you're gonna if you're gonna shoot it at um you know one of the mistakes people make is they 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 shoot it slow motion or they shoot it knowing they're going to speed it up but now you you don't have you have the wrong it looks it looks a little um framey because you have the wrong shutter speed. So what you're better off doing is if you're gonna move slowly, is to open all the way up to three, a 360 shutter if you're gonna go half the speed instead of 180 degree shutter. And then when you speed it, make it twice as fast, the motion blur will be correct. Um, and uh, it looks, it just looks more pleasing to the eye um, when you when you kind of make that work. So so it's, it's um, but it's a, lot of, it's a lot of fun for high-end houses. Um, the, uh, they, they do this a lot. They fly through the houses um, and obviously they don't want to damage the houses because most of the houses that they spend the money on for these kind of drone shots are 2 million and above. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Paul Wallace in Cedar Creek, Texas. And he says, what's the best way to watch Zoomtopia? Sign up. Let's go to Zoomtopia um, and, si and, and uh, sign up and you'll be able to join the event. I, I, one thing I actually am uncertain of for our little our watch party that we're going to find out real quickly here is uh, I don't know if we're if it's in Zoom I don't know if some of us won't be able to watch it on the same computer you know because we're doing a watch a sidier experience we may be in a situation where we can't it'll be interesting we haven't done it before so we'll find out next question. Yeah, pull out your phone or iPad and see if you can get it there. Uh, here we go. A Brody Hafner in New York City. AMC Theaters just announced a partnership with Zoom to offer existing central city theaters as Zoom meeting spaces for 75 to 150 people in three-hour blocks. Who would be the likely target audience for this service? Um, Mitchell? Seems like it would be a great setup for corporations that need to regional meetings and things of that nature. Um, we did a similar experiment, not with Zoom, but we just pulled a satellite truck up uh, at Penn Cinema downtown here, and they have an IMAX theater, and it's just amazing what you can accomplish with that. But also you need the accommodations for doing this kind of stuff. You need a big data pipe and maybe some other things that uh, we need to be able to do a, a, an event like that. Good, Bill. Some years ago, we did this for a new CEO coming in to handle um, a corporate office presentation that uh, the local big corporation was putting on. We went into a commercial theater. The thing was, we couldn't really tap into the commercial theater's projector. So we set up a series, uh, a front of house position in the middle of the theater, stacked up projectors and did the traditional front projection into that world. But it worked really well. I had a single camera operator there and she was taking pictures of the people uh, who were talking and it really worked well. The first time the CEO turned around and saw his head five stories high, he kind of freaked out a little bit. <laughs> he settled into it. And it was actually a good meeting. And I think it really commanded the attention of everybody there. So I think a lot of theaters do that kind of thing. And they know how to help you execute it. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see two way, uh, <laughs> two way communication with between theaters is complex. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see how where this goes, I actually have no real vision on what what they're doing there. And I, I don't know, 
what they would, you know, 75 to 150 people is probably the smallest theater in the AMC, in AMC. So it's probably one of the little theaters off to the edge, um, you know, because 150 seats, I think, is about the minimum, um, you know, so... So the, um, you know, I do think that there is an, one of the things to think about down the road is distributed events. So events that are not all happening at the same place, I mean, they're all happening at the same time, but not in the same place. And this is going to be, I think, a growing industry. There is a, um, there's a lot of pressure. There's 30% of the population doesn't want to go to these anymore. No, doesn't want to go to, doesn't want to travel to go to these anymore. That's the, that's the stat, Right. And then you have, you know, uh, companies that are now getting more and more climate conscious. So people are starting to ask them, so what's the carbon impact of your event? And, you know, does everyone actually need to come to it? And, you know, we've all now proven that we can do all this stuff during COVID. And so there's, there's a lot of downward pressure on moving people around. But there's an opportunity for, for folks to um, build an event that happens all over the world but in lots of little pockets. And I think that this is a, um, you know, so that you could watch the keynote, maybe maybe the next Zoomtopia will be, you could watch the keynote in 12 cities or 20 cities. And if you look at some of the stuff that Zoom's been working on with, um, you know, IzzyCast and with, um, you know, we're not Zoom working on that, but but uh, Trickatronics uh, is IzzyCast, um, um, being able to send data, you could literally light all those theaters up and have all the lighting effects and, everything else happening in each theater um, synced to a, a, a central control and be able to do two-way, be able to have conversations, all of those things would be possible. So um, I think that there's a lot of, you know, business meetings, house of worship, like think of a TD, a TD Jakes could take over, you know, these, um, these theaters and fill them, you know, like, you know, and, and so there's a lot of, uh, a lot, you know, concerts potentially, I think that concerts over Zoom might be a little rough, um, on, you know, in the current technology, but, um, but those are all things that might be possible. Next question. Next one comes to us from Harshid Trivedi here on the panel in Daytona Beach, Florida. And he starts, <laughs> do I have to sing this? The, the uh, stinger that we've all heard, I got the power. Sorry, lots of talk of cables and fun stuff like that. I'm seeking a USB-C dongle with power. Any recommendations able to hook up to say an S22 Ultra, a Pixel and so forth? I go ahead, Serge. The USB-C dongle that has power uh, passed through that I use a lot is the Apple one. Um, it's in my bag and because I bought it with my MacBook Pro a long time ago. It's still work with any USB-C device. The only thing I'm not sure is if you want to use the display of your Samsung S22 or things like that. Not sure that it's going to work for that. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Joe Kidd in the Bay Area in California. It says, would the AudioQuest Jitterbug FJ, FMJ introduce noticeable latency or other undesirable effects if used between an MV7 and a Mac? Would it be inevitable? Thanks. I've never seen this before. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I, I, uh, so this looks like it's a USB... Um, I guess that it's FJM says a USB filter. It it is a noise filter, and it um yeah I'm, I'm trying to yeah it, it's a power and noise filter. I've never seen this. Before. It looks like you plug it between the the it, you plug it between the your USB audio input and your computer, and then it removes some noise, um, uh, I guess. Uh, I, I think that it's, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, it's, I, I, all I'll say is that noise reduction is really hard. <laughs> so it might be able to do some basic noise reduction, uh, so, but I don't think it's going to do the kind of thing that we see with, um, you know, noise assist or, or cedars. Uh, Nick, Bill? No, I don't think it can that, that uh, against the laws of physics. I suspect that what this is is a simple subtractive filter probably to take out uh, 60, hertz, uh, 60 hertz hum or things like that. I mean, when you don't have any power applied to anything, all it can really do is block certain frequencies say, or filter certain frequencies. I will say that, you know, it, it could be miniaturized, you know, like a noise huh? assist. A noise assist USB connection, that's all, that's all it does, uh, would actually, you know, for... 200 bucks or something like that or 300 bucks that that's would be interesting a, that'd be a really interesting product you know just just a noise assist um oh yeah it's a really good idea 
Anyway, it's a good idea. I don't think this one isn't that. <laughs> Next question. It says dual discrete noise dissipation circuits. Ooh. Yes. Okay, Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, I remember reading about a stadium that hosted an event where gamers could play games on the big screen. How would you extend an HDMI signal to reach said screen and convert the resolution? And wouldn't the latency make most games unplayable? Go ahead, Serge. The first thing I do is not to extend the H uh, HDMI, is to convert HDMI to SDI. Because... Depending on the length, you might need to have uh, SDI to fiber. You might just be able to use SDI that it's not far enough and it's going to work. Um, that's my yeah, recommendation for that. You shouldn't lose more than a frame if you if you if you gen lock everything together. It should be pretty pretty fast. You should be able to play it. It, it may not. It, you wouldn't win a game playing it like if you were playing against real pros. But being able to play on a big screen would be a lot of fun. Um, next question. Next one from Douglas Karma. Oh, I'm sorry, Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm looking for a reasonably priced camera that will take two thirds inch broadcast lenses. It'll mostly be used to develop lens calibration files. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Well, I'm just wondering. So, B4 lenses, most some cameras, not all of them, but some cameras like the Black Magic line, you can order them with a B4 mount and probably adapt those lenses. But I'm a little concerned recommending that because you said it's going to be used to develop lens calibration files. So you may want something that uh, the geometry back focus and everything else is as close to a standard as possible if you're using this for standards measurement. So I would dive deeper into the technology of this before you use uh, just a different mount on a commonly used inexpensive camera. That's my thought. So the, you know, Blackmagic makes a two thirds inch uh, broadcast camera. So I think they still make it. Um, they, the G, the, the generation of one of the, of the Blackmagic broadcast camera um, was two thirds with a B4 mount. So you could definitely use, um, or can, you can get it with a B4 mount. If you want to make sure that it's a traditional B4 mount and you want to make sure that it's absolutely a two thirds, um, you know, and, and not something that is a little different, you can also look at something, you can look at something older um, that, that you can plug in. Uh, what we had laying around, we did, we used them, they were originally for 3D cameras, not th big 3D camera setups, um, but they, you can probably buy them used now are the Sony HDC. P1s. Um, these are, we had about four of these P1s and we had them because we were, before we were doing lots of black magic, we were doing lots of Sony. And so, um, so we had them, they were, uh, they are just the, basically a little bit more than the optical block from a, um, from a 950. And so they, they, um, you can get them and they'll do progressive out. Um, and uh, so that might be, uh, you know, that's going to be a very traditional B4 um, mount to a two thirds um, that, that you can, that you can use there. So um, that was uh, the HTC P1, uh, and you can buy them used. They're not they're not around anymore. But to ge generate your files, they could work. But if you want 4K to generate those files, then um, then I would go ahead and lean back towards um, the Blackmagic uh, two thirds. Next question. Uh, Keenan Campbell in Nevada here in the USA says, let's talk smartwatches, Apple Watch Ultra or others. Longtime Garmin watch user and on the fence for the new Ultra. Thoughts? Uh, Serge? I think it depends because uh, for me, uh, I'm more into the Apple ecosystem. So the Apple Watch has the edge for that. But I have a friend that has a Garmin. He is in the Apple ecosystem. But the Garmin ability, ability to have the backtrack with a map, I think it's a deal breaker for him right now. So Good, Bill. Yeah, I can't afford the new fancy one. But I got to say that the Apple Watch that I adopted probably three years ago, four years ago, has literally changed many of my daily habits in life. I think they're building so much intelligence and interactivity into these watches that uh, I spent probably 15 or 20 years seldom wearing a daily watch. And now I honestly feel like it better be the first thing I put on in the morning every morning or I'm getting behind on the metrics of staying healthier and a bunch of other things in life. It's just so useful. It's crazy. Yeah. The, um, uh, the big, big advantage of the Garmin, in my opinion, is that it, it's potential. Uh, we just don't know about the ultra yet. I mean, I, I have one, <laughs> I love it. Um, but the, uh, it, it's battery life. Of course it lasts for a very long time. Uh, the ultra you know, lasts a couple of days. Uh, it, it does last a couple of days. Now mine lasts a little bit longer cause I leave it on, there's like a, I slide it up to this dark mode all the time just because that's why I, I like it to sit in, in general, but it also increases the battery life. Um, really like it. 
Um, I think that the disadvantage that Garmin has is that it's not going to be part of an ecosystem and they're competing with a uh, trillion dollar company that's going to keep on adding features and working, making deals that Garmin probably can't make. So in the long term, I mean, it, the only thing that I would say is that if you're out there and you're going to be out for a long time and you're afraid you're going to need battery, you know, battery is going to be an issue. I'd stick with the Garmin. Outside of that, I don't know how the Garmin will really compete with what uh, what Apple's building. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. Alex, you mentioned centrally controlled lighting across multiple event sites. Would you need the to, uh, to time code the lighting or would it be busked in real time? I think that there's a potential to do it in real time. I don't think that I think that you could send cues. Um, so if you look at again, what we're really tracking is things like IzzyCast that's that can send audio, video and data um, over, you know, through the Zoom infrastructure. And so, um, but it could be done in a couple different ways. But basically tying those things together, you should be able to, you know, send lighting cues and laser cues and any other cues that you want, um, you know, through the system um, and have those all happen at the remote end. Um, and one of the things, you know, so, so I think that that is going to be a really interesting opportunity when it comes to um, building global events that have no, that maybe have a center, but but there's physical people, you know, there's people coming, meeting each other, getting coffee and donuts and being able to uh, be part of the event without actually having to fly. And, and you know, we want to think about like all the people that getting a visa to the United States would be complicated. Getting a flight to the United States, get, just flying from New York to L.A. is really expensive. So all of those things are things that, you know, being able to spread the events out is, is very powerful. Next question. Jack Cannon in USA. Phoenix says, looking for HDMI-based cameras to install on a vehicle in motion, ideally 4K and not DSLR, will be used for capturing off-road footage. I'm just reading through it. Uh, I mean, I think that... Um, go ahead, Bill. The forces when you're off-road are radical. Um, we had that circumstance out on the, the flight line of the rockets when I stood in the back of a truck with a phone on a gimbal. And I was amazed, first of all, at how successful those little micro gimbals are. But that was a human being with my legs reacting to the bed of the truck coming up and down and a gimbal that had very sophisticated electronic uh, electronics in it, further stabilizing the shot. And that gave me a very satisfying result. If you're bolting something onto an off-road vehicle, it's going to be pounding and racking. You want to make sure everything is as stable as possible. Yeah, one, one thing that you may want to think about is um, how often you want to pull the camera off to remove storage. And so my temptation would be to build a subsystem. So I would probably, like right now, I'm, and I have to admit, I'm hoping that, that they upgrade this, but I would be really tempted to use the micro cinema, micro studios, the 4K micro studios from Blackmagic. Um, those are have been very popular in cars, <laughs> interior cars, looking at people, um, but also exterior. They're not super expensive. Um, they have 4K, they're, a, they're SDI out rather than HDMI out, but they have an HDMI. So you can do HDMI if you want to look at something, if you need to look at it, but if you... But the SDI could go back, and what I would be doing is in the trunk or, or somewhere else, I'd put some hyperdecks, and i just run run cables back to them and record there because then I can just pull them, I could pull stuff out of them really quickly, and I wouldn't have to mess with the cameras um, to um, to do that. I, I don't know if that subsystem works. You'd have to have a place for that to go. Um, but the, there's a couple different ones. There's the BGH from Panasonic, which is a four-thirds. Um, there is, and that'll do 4K. Um, so those are those are small ones. If you want to do something at night, um, you may want to think about it's not 4K, um, but if you want to do stuff at night, take a look at the Canon uh, ME 200s and ME 20s. Those are expensive. Well, the ME 20s are really expensive, but the ME 20s will see at night. Like it, you can't see your hand, and you're getting a signal. Um, so the I think they go up to like three million ISO. Um, so it's a it's a really uh, we we've used them in in places where we're shooting in the dark. <laughs> so uh, next question. Next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. We're considering putting a car on a flatbed dolly on an unused railroad sliding to film three cars in the same motion distance for a nonprofit's commercial. Sorry for not being clear earlier. Go ahead, Mitchell. I think that you're going to have some problems, uh, unless there's something we don't know yet about your request here, uh, about placing cars on a railroad siding on a flatbed, because it's, it's going to be bumpy and it's going to be jarring, sort of like Bill was mentioning uh, using a, a different camera to get those car shots. 
I think a, a, a well uh, uh, cleared road surface with a camera car might do you better, even better if you had a uh, uh, you know a, a steady cam on it to be able to get it. But again, I don't know exactly what you're shooting. I have seen your storyboards or anything else, but it seems like you're going to a lot of trouble to get those cameras mounted on a railroad siding. Yeah, and I know that you don't have enough. I mean, budget is always a thing. I would. We've stolen those kind of shots, what we call stealing shots, when you don't get all the permits that you're supposed to. <laughs> I mean, I've shot car shots where we don't steal them and we get police escorts and everything else. And by the way, I could say it's super fun because if you shoot if you shoot with a police escort, they just they just go to the stoplights and, and just park and make everybody wait while you drive through. It's really, you're like, I could do this all the time. Anyway, so, um, but, uh, uh, you, you know, a lot of times we've also used uh, convertibles, you know, so and and you know rented convertibles that we can that we can go out of. Or the other thing that works really well is a van that the door slides open. We did that on the PCH, you know, where we had we had a van uh, and we had had the car drive by, um, and we were just shooting out of the side of the van. Um, and then finally, the other thing that you can do, of course, is uh, shoot background plates. And um, and then put the car into a green screen, you know, and just pull the green screen. Then then no one's moving. You have to figure out how you're going to deal with wind, and you got to decide how well you're. And I did a for a Japanese film. We did about a hundred shots that way, where we just we went out and shot all the background plates. Um, we used the same camera and same angle for the background plates as we did for the car. And then we weren't trying to do all of it at one time. And it was uh, it was again we did a hundred over a hundred shots that way. Um, and the main thing that is important is interactive light on the on the foreground. So if you're shooting in the evening, we literally, I can probably find videos of it. We, we literally went like this, so there's stuff going past them. Um, you also, that angle is really, really important. And your green screen technique has, needs to be um, exceptional, in which we, you know, it's, it's not about how to pull a green screen, it's how to shoot the green screen. Um, good, even, uh, well-lit green screen uh, will go a long way. Go ahead, Bill. I would I would head in the direction of an off-road truck on the side road rather than trying to do it from the railroad tracks for a couple of reasons. Those railroad tracks are going to be owned by somebody. The right-of-way may be municipal, but it may be a private company. And just getting insurance things, we've had too many circumstances where, where idiots were filming on a bridge or something like that, and people have died because a train, and even if this is truly abandoned and there's no chance of a train coming by, that right-of-way will belong to someone. And getting permission, I would think, would be very difficult. So uh, a camera car on an adjacent road or two parallel roads, if you can find that, uh, would probably be a lot easier and probably get you just as good results. Next question. Tony uh, looks like Salamkus. I hope I'm getting that right. Tony of Florida says, has anyone used the M2 iPad Pro 12.9 inch in the new reference mode for color accurate client reviews? The mini LED XDR panel seemed to have a latency issue when cutting from bright to dark screens. And he notes screen flashes. Are there alternatives? You know, I haven't really... Um... I haven't gotten the M2, <laughs> so so I've been, uh, so I, I don't I don't know. Um, the I got saturated with how many Apple products can I buy in in a in a month? <laughs> so so uh, so I uh, so I, I I had a phone and a watch, and I decided to wait on the iPad for a little while. Um, so so the uh, I, I haven't I haven't tested that. I, you know the the next thing from that is an actual monitor that's going to do the thing. You know, like a, a real monitor that's going to play it. I don't think there's anything else that small and that inexpensive. Uh, to do it otherwise. Go ahead, Bill. Since it's a barely out in public product, I will say that one of the things I've noticed on the internet is that as soon as Apple or any big company comes out with a brand new product, the first people out the door, the ones say, here's why it doesn't work for everything you want to do it. I'm not saying that there aren't issues, but they Apple tends to note those issues and solve them pretty quickly. So I would imagine that that's going to turn in to a pretty decent product. Why? Because Apple does a lot of research on their displays. They put tons of money into things like that new iPad display, and they eventually make sure that it works in most circumstances. No guarantees, but I think if there's some small latency issue, it wouldn't surprise me if they don't engineer their way around that in the kind of first checkout period. Next question. Next one comes from Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida. What dongles are necessary for the latest generation of the iPad Pro? Go ahead, Serge. I will, not, I will not say necessary, but I will say recommended. Uh, I use the Magic Keyboard because the Magic Keyboard will pass the power through the, the Magic Keyboard to the, the iPad. So that's taken care of. And then after that, I can use a dongle to with the USB-C to plug anything else I need uh, after that. Next question. 
Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, with AMC theaters marketing the movie theaters as hybrid event spaces, where would you put the crew and or production equipment? Could you snake the cabling into the production room? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's interesting about theaters is they're all different. <laughs> so so every every theater is a new problem um, and where you put them. Sometimes, um, sometimes they have a projectionist area. Some of the projectionist areas for theaters are cavernous. And like there's just a lot of... There's a hand, you know, especially when they moved away from film and back to digital, the pro digital projectors, projectors are often small, much smaller. So if it's a multiplex, and so the way that some of the multiplexes are set up is that the projection booth covers all of the theaters. And it's just like one big hallway that's pretty wide. And you can get a lot of gear up there and make that work and go to one or many of the theaters relatively easily. Other ones, the projection room may be big enough to put a small fly kit. In other cases, um, there are there might be an area like there's some theaters where they had a cafe they're not really using the cafe so you can just build out on the cafe to do that um so so there's a and then what you do is a lot of times what you're doing is doing fiber so um what the easiest way to get in and out of those things is to is to just try to get all your signals onto a handful of tac 12s or something like that so you got a couple tac 12s that are going to go in they're going to carry all your cameras they're going to carry your audio they're going to carry your internet you're going to carry anything else you want so that you can minimize what you're putting actually into the theater because the problem is is wherever you're building up you usually have a lot of time the theaters you do not have a lot of time because they have to cut the theater down if you're setting up in there so it means that your setup time like when amc talks about a three-hour window that's a one-hour show <laughs> like, you know, like a three hour window is a one hour show. It's not a three hour show because you get to go in and now you have to set up and now you have to get ready and then you have to, you know, and then you have to break down. And so what you try to do is minimize how much you're doing there. What'll be really interesting to see with AMC is whether they're going to build subsystems that make all of that possible. So, because, so, so that the average right now they're making, they're providing access to the theaters. I don't know anything past what you asked about this. So I don't know what they're doing, um, but they are um, those subsystems, uh, you know, are a, um, you know, that's, you know, that's the tricky, that's the tricky part is, is how are you going to get all that to work? But um, you can definitely snake a lot of stuff into the projection room or into another room or into another building. We've even for um, big events like that, we've put trucks outside and just run the fiber up into the, into the building. So you just put a broadcast truck on the, on, you know, it depends on where it is. You can put the broadcast truck outside. You can put it in the loading dock. Um, you can, you know, do, do a lot of those things. It's just a matter of how far the fiber goes and fiber, single mode fiber will go a long way. Go ahead, Bill, real quick. We've had to do that in some of these corporate presentations and we just built a little front of house location. Uh, we've done it in the center of the audience, put a platform in with something down to the bottom, even though the, these theaters are often raked pretty heavily, you can pull a platform in there to put projectors or uh, a central station for mixing and things like that. Or we've done it off stage, right or off stage left. Some theaters have a little apron in front of the screen itself and you can put a CEO or somebody up there. So they're above the level. Uh, if they're speaking to the crowd, mm -hmm. it's just, it, as Alex says, in individual per, per theater. You got to look at it and decide how to fix. The, what I will say is that um, theaters are not a great place to do the production and they're a great place to interact with the audience. So having the audience in there watching the theater and maybe have a camera return back to them is a great thing to do. Uh, doing the production in the theater is, um, theaters weren't built for that. <laughs> so most of them don't have anywhere to do that. The other thing you want to consider is like, you know, nailing like all the, the all those nosebleed seats in the front, just, just carting them off and, and not use them. Um, and then build in the, in the, sometimes they have a little bit of a foyer area that, or not foyer, but a little stage area in the front. And it's a lot easier to use if you get rid of the people. Uh, next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana wonders if the Windows Dev Kit 2023 is worth it for 599 US dollars, US or not. Um, I don't do Windows Dev, so I don't know. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael back again. Alex, you mentioned you wouldn't use unbalanced audio in production. For a small home studio in a controlled setting, would it be less risky if only one device, the Mod X, is unbalanced? Mitchell? Hold on, let me uh, challenge, uh, not challenge, channel uh, Alex for a second. Never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever do unbalanced. If you can help it. Don't just don't build. You don't build something around unbalanced. No. So you, no. you know, if if you if you get stuck in a bind, you can use it for something, but don't don't build around it. Um, next question. Harshi Trevitti, Daytona Beach, Florida. How long before you might have audio issues on an audio cable? Three point five to three point five millimeter male 
connectors. I'm presuming there are, of course, balance choices and not balanced. However, quarter to one eighth is normally used with pro gear, like the 7506s or the 20s. I have a bad, ooh, I've run out of words here. Uh, bad experience? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell, real quick. We're, we're going to just keep Never, these. ever, ever, ever. Bad <laughs> cable, basically trying to replace a uh, 3.5 cable. Yeah. So any, any good brands? Uh, I don't have any. Yeah, don't have anything specific. We, we just don't use that many of them. Um, next question. Next one from uh, Douglas Carmichael. With a Zoom based, with a Zoom hosted event in theaters, wouldn't there be a loss of interactivity with a large space with large audiences? Uh, it depends on how you set it up. Zoom is going to be the same latency as we see here today uh, between those theaters if they have uh, the proper internet. So you should be able to have just about the same uh, interactivity that you would have in any other Zoom call, except the theaters are there. The real problem is um, echo. Echo is the problem in every theater, every large event space. You have to figure that out. All right. We are changing subjects to our second hour. And we have uh, Felipe Narde here. Um, hi, Felipe. Can you, can you hear us okay? Hello, guys. Can you hear okay? Yes. Yeah. And where are you coming in from? I'm coming in from Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Amazing. Amazing. I, 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 I don't, I don't take it for granted that we can just have somebody come in from, from Rio de Janeiro and, uh, and talk to us about something that great, uh, and we don't have to, you know, it's just, it was instant and, and seamless. So anyway, Felipe, can you tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes. Uh, so, uh, basically I'm creating ways for performers, presenters, teachers, uh, anyone doing online courses and dealing with a large audience or a small audience virtually, I'm, uh, creating ways for them to do that seamless. Uh, seamlessly and without needing a team and even being able to get into this without prior technical background. And so what kind of events are you working on? So uh, people doing workshops, uh, lectures, teaching online, um, also on the performance side, people doing magic shows for uh, corporate companies or ticket shows, and especially people running their uh, one-person operation the uh you know how did you get started i um i'm a very uh I've, i got into this a little bit uh accidentally i i'm a software engineer was working at a company and i love magic and i was part of this group of magicians when the pandemic came and i see a lot of these great performers stop performing and i um i figured that i I could try to do something and I started working with these people. Um, and um, the funny story about this production, because I'm doing some kind of productions that um, that brings the audience into the screen at, at the time, I, there was no one doing that until I got, I saw one magician doing it. So he got everyone around him and he was doing this show with everyone around him that, that looks really cool. And I asked him how he was doing this. And he said, oh, you know, magician's code, they can't tell you. And I spent the next three months trying to figure because uh, there is this weird thing about magic that you cannot like steal anyone's secrets. So, but I didn't know exactly what the the line was because it was a, not a magic trick. But anyway, I started to create and try to figure it, and I did. I was able to do this, and I showed him just to make sure that I didn't learn from uh, from him or it was not a secret. And he, that, he told me, "Oh, that's nice. I want that." What do you mean you want that? Right. No, no, it was just a screenshot. <laughs> so that's where I began and I started growing from, from there. And, helping and other how people. You, and, uh, yeah. And what tools can you tell, can you, can you give us some of the secrets? How do you, how do you actually pull yes. this off? Yeah, uh, basically I'm using OBS Studio. And at the beginning I was using OBS Studio with, for example, when we are talking about screens with the gallery around, cropping from the Zoom window. But at some point, uh, we started to bump into a lot of problems. So, for example, if the number of people change, you don't have, you're not cropping the right position anymore. And I started to use Zoom OSC for that to to create. A, I created a system, and actually, it was one. Uh, I started working on Stream Deck app before Companion was uh, even built. So I started creating my uh, system on Stream Deck that integrated Zoom OSC. And um, but since the beginning of the year. I'm not using Zoom SC nor Zoom ISO anymore. I decided to create my own um, apps, my own tools using this Zoom SDK. So uh, basically what I'm doing now is I've created a system 
that uh, connects OBS, it connects the production with the audience and makes it in simple controls on the Stream Deck. So simple that a one person operation could create interactivity with the audience uh, by themselves. So you're using the you're using the Zoom SDK. So you're not using the ISO or or, or OSC, but you're no. using Zoom SDK. So you're writing right. and you're using that platform to, to do that. How does that work? Yeah, um, let me show you one second. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to uh, show you OBS. So this is OBS, and right now I'm connected to um, a real Zoom call which is pretty similar to what you guys have in office hours. It's a Zoom call, it stays open with usually uh, 30 to 50 participants with their camera on so that people, uh, I run a program where I help people do this. This is one of the results of this program. And uh, now, are those, are those live an participants or, or are they, are those live participants yeah. that are there right now? No, this, uh, well, uh, it is, uh, they are all recordings, but they are actual Zoom instances. And how you know, I can ask many, one to unmute. How many, how many do you feed? How do you feed that many into Zoom? Is that that's the SDK or is that Zoom? Yeah, it's a, it's a very complex setup, but it's uh, using lots of computers. And I keep the system 24 hours running and mimicking these webcams in a loop of one minute. Interesting. Is it a computer for each person or is it a, or you, do you have? No, uh, I don't know the math right now, but it's, um, I don't know if it's five people per computer or something yeah. like that. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So go ahead. So so you have um so you have this uh, you have these these loops that are all that are all there and this is really useful. We have a much simpler version of this that we do the same thing with about yeah. twelve people, um and uh, and we use that to test for us test Zoom ISO and uh, and Zoom OSC. We just it's it's incredible to have something that's just up and ready to roll. It's it's one of the hardest things to manage, isn't it? Yeah, one second. Let me just adjust the audio real quick. There you and, go. Uh, yeah, so so, and you go. And yeah, so you even have uh, a pirate. You have a pirate in there. It's pretty great. Um, yeah, so yeah, so anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this, uh, so uh, these people are all uh, members of the program, so uh, there are oh, few performers great. in here. <laughs> I decided to do this. So, so what do you have here? Yeah. So this is, this is an OBS? Yeah, this is an OBS. And... I'm sorry, you probably go a little, little, little louder. Yeah. It's okay. I, yeah, I'm a, a little louder, right? Okay, so this is OBS. I'm a little bit confused. Should I reduce or should I increase? You no, know, you're down to about negative 36 on our left meter, so you need to come up, increase the volume okay. by okay. a good chunk. I will, I will keep a look. Got you. I will, I will keep a look in for a second. Okay, so basically this is OBS, and what I'm going to show you right now is the... well what we can do with a live production. So this is pulling all the images from the, um, uh, from the live zoom. So what you're seeing here mm -hmm. is live uh, from this image from the live zoom. If there are less people on the call, I'm doing some automatic adjustments. What are the automatic adjustments that you have there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show you right now. So now I just uh, turned off a few cameras, so, so just so you can see again. Mm -hmm. Before, um, there are several cameras on, and what it looked like was the when I pull up the gallery, this is what it looks like. And when there are less people on the call, it's adjusted automatically. So the performer doesn't have to do anything. And instead of, in place of people, we can place some logos that they customize for the company they are uh, presenting or performing and talking uh, with, for example, or their own uh, logos, you know? So I make this easy for them. Also, um, one thing that um, I developed in these systems is a way, a workflow for them to pull up people easily. So for example, I can uh, press a single button and it will bring someone. This person has a camera off, so I can, I will go to this panel here. This is a panel that Resembles Companion. It's the gallery, but it's the gallery in a special order. It's showing the co-host first, and then it's gonna show people that have the avatars on. And I can, before I call, before any preparation, 
um, important to note, note that everything that I'm doing here is to allow impromptu um, collaboration and integration with the virtual audience without pre or preparation, because you don't know what people are going to be there. You might know their name. So for example, I know that Rich could be here. I type it Rich and he gained a star, but he doesn't have to have the exact name Rich. He, he, ha he can have his surname and it's, uh, it will match either way. We'll get the closest match to the person that uh, you want to be interacting with. So uh, I'm going to pin someone here. And <clears throat> there is this window here, which is similar to the second screen, but is um, um, that's where the web Zoom uh, SDK is running. So I have the real Zoom where I present, I connect to the regular Zoom, not Zoom OS, or Zoom OS, just regular Zoom, I connect here, I present, and on OBS, I uh, have integrated the Zoom SDK inside it. So it's not a window capture, it's um, a directly um, clean feed of the, the image coming from the Zoom SDK here. Well, and so, is that, isn't example, that, is, that an, yeah. is that an issue? Because I, I thought that the Zoom SDK doesn't really interact with a regular Zoom meeting. Is that, are you outside of that? So it does, it does, it doesn't agree. Uh, Zoom C and Zoom ISO is built on top of the Zoom SDK. Okay. So if you can, right. Mm -hmm. um, and what is happening right here is that we are uh, connecting through the call with two Zoom. One is the backstage, which is this it. one mm -hmm. here where I can, I can pin people by pressing buttons. Right, right. And I can bring them to the screen, uh, just like that. And if I want to bring more uh, into the screen, I could go to the gallery panel again, for example, I will, um, let's say, I want to select other people. Oh, by the way, let me show this. This is saying replace and pin. I could change it to add. So now if I click on someone, it's gonna add this person to the mix. And I can press the same button that I had before to bring both on screen. So if I'm in the gallery panel and I add one more, it adjusts automatically to display the three people that I have selected. And this is a, uh, this is kind of like just the basis of um, the system that comes out of the box and it's very customizable. I just to finish the demonstration here, uh, I'm also created something that to interact with the emojis. So when people send an emoji reaction on Zoom, and they can send just any reaction. Let me send a, a globe, maybe. Uh, the reactions will pop in on screen right here. It's popping on, on two places. So, so they're so they're putting their reaction in, and it's pulling that reaction and then putting it into the in, sending it to OBS as a separate layer. And you know yeah. who sent that, right? Is that I mean, in in that case. But uh, well, you can't see who is uh, through the. In, for the panel, uh, it's an overlay. You can see who is sending, but from the participant window, you could see the reaction on someone is on the call <laughs> to send the heart. Maybe I have to turn it off. This is the call that uh, stays open all the time uh, for the members of the program to participate. That's really interesting. Um, so, so the um, and so all of this is running through. You have your application. You have um, obviously Zoom. Um, you have the OBS and then you have the stream deck. And is that, is there anything else part of that puzzle? Yeah, the stream, deck, no, the stream deck app that I have built. Let me see if I can um, shut right, up. Right, but that's, the, that's the a key piece of it, right? That's how you, that's, that's the, that's the, that's how you run everything. That's how everything's connected. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this stream deck app, which is not a companion app, it's a stream deck app. It coordinates uh, the communication between OBS and Zoom. And are you doing uh, customization to OBS to do that? To do that, is it a specific OBS oh, build? Yeah. No, it's not a specific OBS build. But we have uh, I have built kind of a framework for people to to do this. So, so like they learn how to. It's not a template. It's a framework in a sense of uh, there is some organization um, methods. Because let me like let me explain. Because it's I know that it might sound a little bit confusing. So uh, I showed you that we can show the gallery around at any moment. Let me even bring up everyone from the call. So I showed you that you can uh, show the, the gallery around, but let's say that you want to create something and you want to have the gallery around. You, have, you want to have some slideshows and you want to show the gallery around at any moment. The, uh, the way that I have built this framework is that the only two scenes on OBS that you are uh, at all times is either me or full gallery. 
being mm -hmm. me, your camera, info gallery, the gallery round. So uh, in a way, uh, we build it in a little bit different way so that we can, uh, let me see here, slides. I can uh, show my slides. I can go to the next slide, for example, and I can show the gallery around me at any moment as well. So it's a way to organize um, the, the system so that uh, you can have that. And you can create custom scenes as well. Like if I just create a new scene here and I would want to create a composite with the spectators, I could add participant one, for example. And this is my participant one. I just need to add one more thing here. Overlay. Overlay center global. Okay. So this is participant one. And I will add participant two, for example. And there is a scene that named participant two. You can have up to four participants. And this is coming from uh, the SDK and it can go up to 720p. It doesn't go up or, uh, higher than that but you can have up to three particip four participants on the call and you can create composites with it and animations. There is even a member of the program that created a Hogwarts virtual show where he had the train of the Hogwarts going in the, with the people, uh, the participants oh, wow. inside it. Yeah, so this is a system for you, a framework for you to create your own, um, your own thing. So this is what I was showing you. It's just what came uh, come out of the box. That's amazing. And how do you, um, what's the, and, and for, for our producers, we'll get to your questions here pretty soon. Um, how do you uh, monetize this? Like how, wh what's the service that you provide for folks? Yeah, so I have, a, uh, I have this program that I, uh, where I help this one person, um, performance presenters, teachers, coaches, and uh, anyone dealing with a uh, virtual audience. I have this program called Inside the Show where I run to help them get up and running with something that is really uh, powerful and engaging and doesn't require a team. So I train people to produce these. It's not an event in a sense that it's repeatable. It's something like, more like, like a show, but it's not uh, just for performance. Uh, so I teach them how to do this. And I have built these tools because I, I bump into to lots of limitations. Even with Zoom, I see there was a lot of limitations to what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and. I created, started creating these tools and it's inside this program that I run. Um, that's where, uh, how I monetize, I sell this program. And how much does it cost? Which I open just, I open it uh, two times a year. Last time it cost uh, $1,500. Right. It's um, full year access to working with us, plus uh, five weeks acceleration sprint where I do live class and we offer a lot of support right. through the community and live chat to get them uh, up and running. So, so basically, what what someone gets when they when they buy this from you is they get the software that you've built, but they also get support classes. It's a really interesting model of that's kind of a whole. You're going to help them get off the ground and and produce their events exactly. inside of that. Exactly. And so it's so it's a little bit more expensive than we pay for a piece of software, but it is. But it's a fully featured solution yeah. for folks. It's really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. What are the biggest challenges that people have? Uh, with using the product that you're still, that you, that you work on or what, where do they need, is it just thinking about how they're going to do it or is it, is it, cause it seems yeah, like the yeah. software has gotten pretty, is because they're getting the whole thing. So they get the, they can just kind of turn it on, right? It's, it's fairly yeah. turnkey, but you still have the ability to go into OBS and keep on designing to customize it for there. And then I guess they're working with you to, to figure out how they customize it for, for what they want. Yeah, exactly. So basically, um, the way it works that we, uh, I teach them how to get off the ground with uh, what I showed you. Then we, I help them with setting out audio and music, video, making things that will, uh, that will increase the production. I teach them workflows for them to be able to operate that uh, as a one person. 
and we have a lot of practice as well. So we have practice sessions where we get people to come in with the system and do a, a small coordination with the virtual audience. And we get them prepared and confident to get off the ground, then start to creating their own, uh, the trainings, the way that they want, the, the performance, the way that they want. And we are always evolving. For example, one, one of the things that we, um, I, was well, I guess it, I would say that it's actually a really yeah. great place for you to evolve because you're seeing so many different ways that people are putting together their events and kind of working. Yeah. It's not just that you're handing it to them, they're off doing it. You're working with them to, to figure mm -hmm. it out. Right. Yes. It's very powerful. And I, I do learn a lot because of that. I, I get to learn what are the things that people need. For example, last week, one of the discussions that came up in the, in the program was, People run these Q and A's on the virtual setting, and they don't have um, Mukana and uh, mm -hmm. you know all of that structure. And so how they can, and maybe the group is not uh, is smaller. You don't have a, a super large audience. So mm -hmm. how do you can run it without? Because most people are doing these trainings in a very simple way. It looks just like a meeting. So uh, this was one of the things that I come up with uh, this last week. It's. Um, this is a, key, a line of spectators that have their hands raised right now. If I go to Zoom, right. this is uh, their hands, for example. And this is, and it keeps in order, order of who raised their hands up. So we build things like that. We, we And then if you click on that, are you able to select that person if their hands are up? Or is it like it's relatively easy to get to that yeah, person? Yeah, so uh, this, this is the string deck. So if I go to the uh, participants, uh, what you're going to see on the first page is all the people that have their raised hands. So these are all the people that have raised their hand. If someone opened their mic, they're going to bump up to the front of this gallery as well. Mm -hmm. So it's always um, uh, at a, a few taps of a button, you will be able to interact with the person that you want. And then you can, you can um, just tap on one of those and they'll, they'll pop up as a screen for you? Yeah. So if I... Pop, uh, click one of those in my backstage. Let me bring it up. So let me bring this one. This is the, the backstage. It has the, right. their hands raised. And I have them selected. I can just go, I will hide the, the hands and I will click to display the, the participants. That's great. Yeah. And if I wanted to have one more person, because I know that more per people are asking questions, I could uh, change that from replace to add. And now I can press the next person with their hands up and we bring them to the screen huh. very quickly, easily. That's great. I mean, I think that what you're doing is really important to what, you know, a lot of times people are limited to whatever the tools are that are available to them. And, and I think that you're doing a great job at, at figuring out how to, um, you know, really create, we, we really talk a lot about this internally of how do we create events that, that are even stepping past what you could do in the real world. And I think that this is a, this is a great tool to make that actually happen. Let's go ahead. We've got some questions starting to stack up for you. So let's go ahead and throw, uh, we'll go to the producers. Uh, what, what, what's our first question? First one comes from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. And he says, Hey, Felipe, thinking back on your first time on office hours, how have you changed your rig and or workflow since then? All right. So in terms almost of, from in scratch, did you completely rebuild it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I definitely evolved a lot. I uh, was adding as I was um, learning and as I was growing. Uh, right now, I'm using um, a Rode NT1 uh, right on on top of me here. I have the the Black Magic for uh, six. 6K. Uh, whoa, cinema. whoa. Are you, are you bringing that yeah. thing up motor? Is that a motorized uh, in and out? Is that what's happening there? Your mic coming down to the shop. Hope we might have lost him there. Hold on. Oh. Oh, we were doing so well. Oh, I hope it's not a trembler. <laughs> it's an okay, I don't know if it was my fault. Might, might have been my fault. This never happened. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. I'm not, so I'm not touching it again. I just heard, are you really bringing that thing? And then, bing. <laughs> no, it was a, so that was a, but that was that you have a motorized uh, thing to bring the mic up and down. Oh no! Oh, are we having bandwidth issues there? Let's see here. Yeah, I think it's bandwidth issues, but it's I'm at. Something. Yeah, I'm sending for. We can hear you now. We can see yeah. and hear you now. Um, so the so, uh, yes. Go ahead. so so anyway, so you you have uh, you 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 kind of improved that setup there. 
Um, what is the, uh, and then you've, and then this whole platform that you've built has all been since the last time we talked to you, right? Yeah, uh, well, the, the Maestro, the platform has been rebuilt from scratch because it was very, was very dependent from uh, Zone SC. And um, then I started building it from scratch since the beginning of this year. And it's pretty, uh, it's incredibly better uh, than it was before, certainly. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, how are you bringing the real-time data, and he's particularly interested in names and or avatars, into Companion? Yeah, it's not companion. It's a, a, a tool that I have built myself, uh, and this is not um, this is the stream, a stream deck app. This is not a companion app. Right. So you so, built yeah. an app for the stream deck that ties into mm -hmm. the apps that you have built to run the show. So everything is totally. Exactly. You're not cobbling things together, but you just you just have everything running as as one yeah. as one piece. I yeah, got it. Yeah. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania wonders, does your view with the Zoom gallery view scale with different audience sizes? Yeah, uh, I can show this uh, one more time here. So basically what we have right now, we have a full um, room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn people's camera off. Some of the people camera off, just one second. Okay, so turning people camera off. I think we're having, this is the, we're having a little bandwidth, bit of bandwidth issue. issue, bandwidth issues in Brazil, global events. That's what we get every once in a while. So, um, so anyway, so we're going to, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's a really interesting product. And, and I think that there we go. We, we lost, we lost you there for fully big just for a little bit, but we got you back. Um, so you're, you were turning cameras off there. Yeah. So this is uh, with um, some cameras turn it off. And when I turn on some cameras here, let me try. So I, I will turn on real uh, zoom cameras. I'm doing this right now. So the, so, the gallery so started adjusting. The gallery is just automatically adjusting to the number of people. And so the size of the box on the inside is getting bigger and the and there's more being added to the outside as needed. And what's the maximum number? Yeah. It goes up to 25. More than that, it starts to have some network connection issues. So I decided to keep it at 25. And you can, you can scroll through the page too, just to, to go for more people. Yeah, interesting. Um, next question. JJ McKenna in San Rafael, California says, what new changes to Zoom OSC have helped make your business easier? And are there features you're still looking for from Zoom? Uh, the, the thing that has helped me the most was getting out of Zoom OSC because then I could develop everything that I didn't have uh, at the time. So no Zoom OSC being used right here are all tools that I built with the Zoom SDK. The SDK. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think that that's one of the things what 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 we see a lot of is that Zoom OSC and Zoom ISO are really handing us the tools that we need to get off the ground. Um, and then there'll be some people who have the development tools to to keep on going with the SDK. Uh, it just depends on on how far along for production folks. I think that the OSC and ISO are great for us because because we're not ready to sit down and write right into the SDK. Uh, so yeah. so I think it, it works great. But I think that there's and we're seeing that with IzzyCast and other things of, of being able to have uh, use the SDK for transport. Um, next question. Michael Smith in Silverado, California says, are you running OBS on a Mac? And if so, what OS and is it stable? Yeah, so I'm. Um, there's a lot of people in the program running this software, and the minimum spec for Mac that I have seen working well is the Mac Mini M1 at 16 gigabytes, and right. the system does only require one computer to run. So, and and OBS is the OBS solution that you have is run well on the on the M1. Yeah. So uh, regarding OBS, uh, right now the OBS 28 is working uh, really well for the M1. It does have some bugs when you are changing things. So when you're creating scenes, you're editing sources, removing and adding cameras, that's where some instability can occur and it can crash. But when you have everything set up and you're not creating things, but you're using for the production, it has been 100% stable. Right, and I think that we that kind of covers the next uh, the next question, which is just the stability issues. There's <laughs> a lot of us that don't don't use OBS um, in the, um, but you you find, go ahead and read, let me read the question. This is a similar question. Sure, JJ McKenna asks from San Rafael. Do you have any tips for keeping OBS stable on a Mac? There are quite a few users who report issues or distrust in using OBS, but this seems to be at the core of your business model. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
OBS doesn't like when you are changing things uh, on the go. So if you have a camera connected and you decide to just unplug it, it can crash. These kind of things, when you change the things that it has optimized the memory to work with, that's when it can um, crash. When you are just running it, you are good. Uh, and just switching scenes, you're good. Uh, I can say that you have to be careful with the plugins that you are installing. I know that, for example, Source Record is one that crashes OBS, so you have to uh, be very mindful. And if you guys want a tip of uh, what are the plugins that I use that are 100% reliable, I can maybe share some more with you guys. And uh, for Intel Max and Windows, I recommend keeping on OBS 27 a little bit further because there are more instabilities when um, editing, like I said. And for M1 Max, there is a immense performance again for M1. So I do recommend going to a 28, uh, OBS 28, and dealing with these crashes when you are creating something. But don't worry, it's very stable. Both on 27 and both on 28, this behavior is the same. When you are presenting, you're good. Next question. Uh, they always do it. This is from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. When we had that problem and your mic mount came in, they said, what kind of mount was that for the mic? We, we all awesome. want to know what the mount was. So it, you, you have a, you, it, it, came, it looked like it came down motorized. Is, is that the, what, what is that? Yeah, I don't think that break the internet. I, think, I don't think that was a cause. So I will try that again. Yeah. Maybe. What is it going on okay. there? <laughs> that's awesome. My secret, this is a standing desk. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, it's a standing desk. Ah. And it's attached to the standing desk. Yeah. Oh, it's attached. Oh, <laughs> so, so your, your whole desk. desk is going down. Your whole desk is going down. I see now. <laughs> okay. We were, we, great were like, effect. we were like, where did that go? It's a great effect. So, so your, your whole desk, it's just attached to the desk and the desk is going down. It's a, yeah, yeah, I gotta yeah. tell you, if you don't tell us that part, uh, it's a, it's a pretty it's, impressive there's trick. Your magic there, trick. There's, right there. there's a magic trick right there. <laughs> the most impressive part of the <laughs> no, Everyone's like, how did he do that? Uh, all right. All right. Next, next question. Next question comes from Ranjan Sandil in Los Angeles, California. What did you think of 10 and their streaming series that happened over two days? Did you I'm not familiar. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Next question. Uh, Cindy Drozda in Erie, Colorado says, will the software, will this software work if I'm using vMix instead of OBS? It only works with OBS. It's very, yeah, it's, uh, I use all the, yeah. Yeah, all the, you're, you're, it's totally tied in. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, next question. Todd Rains in Allen, Texas. What is the upper limit on participants using your tools and process? Uh, a thousand people are meeting on Zoom. So yeah, so it would it would it can see all of those, and then it's just a matter of paging through them if you need to. So it's up to exactly. twenty five per screen. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, and, and a thousand, but a thousand total. Oh, interesting. Uh, next question. It looks like Christian Pryor Mamulan in Wolfsburg, Germany says, "Which flavors of the Zoom SDK are you using? All of these animations are they JavaScript based with the web flavor of the Zoom SDK?" None of this uh, animation that I showed you guys here are JavaScript related. I do have some that I integrate with. There are, but I didn't show any. Um, these are all basically the, the animations that are being done with the Move Transition plugin, which makes it very easy to do this kind of animation on OBS. Um, yeah, but this doesn't have to do with Zoom SDK. Next question. Next one comes from Cindy Drozd again in Erie, Colorado. What is this software called and do you have a website? Yes, so I do have a website. It should be on the description of the, the YouTube. Um, and the software that I'm running, I call it Maestro. Maestro. But what you will find is about inside the show. Yeah, inside the show and, program is where you have access to and, everything. And for those listening, what what is the web? What's the URL for your? Uh, okay, you I can know. give you. Um, let me check here. I have to get it. We can go to the next question and I, I will yep, sure, absolutely. get it. In our next question. Todd Rains in Allen, Texas is up next. He says, what compute resources are required for your system? So um, the minimum specs for, um, uh, for Mac would be the M1 16 gigabytes. Uh, so I don't think memory is a, a big issue there. Mm -hmm. I think the, the most important part is the GPU. Right, and, and then on a PC? Let's see, I can get uh, the, the minimum specs here if you give me just like 30 seconds, maybe. Yeah, because I, I guess the question oh. is if, it, if it's heavily GPU, uh, is it a, you know, what, what kind of GPU board are you 
uh, requiring for this to actually work on the mm -hmm. on the PC. I, I imagine it's not probably hitting the the CPU very hard. It's mostly a GPU operation. Does that does yeah, that sound? I will have to. I have a uh, I have a note on uh, the. And the are you using? Do, do you run yours on a Mac or a PC? I run my own a Mac. I okay. run my own a Mac. So you typically use an M M1 um, a Mac. Maybe. Okay, I, I got it. Um, so I'm not a Windows uh, user, so I I don't right. know. Um, so we have another Windows expert, PC expert uh, on the group. So there are two. Uh, the minimum spec is the i5 Ryzen 5, 16, 16 gigabyte RAM, mm -hmm. NVIDIA uh, 1060 or similar GPU. Right. Very good. Uh, next question. JJ McKenna, San Rafael is back. Are there any additional features you're still looking for from Zoom? Are there things you'd like to see from Zoom itself that would make your life easier? To be honest, with the SDK, I haven't even tapped into the full potential potential right. of what is possible. So I um, I don't have an answer. I think I have more on my plate than I to cover yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. great. That's great. Absolutely. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you could request a new feature or change from Zoom to help your workflow, what would it be? It's close to the last one. Yeah. Uh, is it? A, but yeah. you, you're pretty much you're happy with what you're getting with the SDK right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Uh, next question. JJ McKenna, San Rafael, California. What's the largest presentation attendance you've had? And were there any issues in handling that large a group? We have two performers on the group that does uh, very big uh, presentations, uh, Dan White and Colin Cloud. They are both magicians and mentalists, um, very famous in the United States. And they run like uh, near 1,000 uh, shows uh, very often. And, and so people are paying admission to those shows and they're doing them over Zoom on your software? Yeah, exactly. That's great. Oh, um, they're not paying for me, right? They, uh, they, want well, they just pay you the membership. Well. Yeah. They just pay you the membership yeah, yeah. to help them do it, but they're charging, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it's interesting. And, and are they using just the standard, what, how are they, when, how are, how are they charging for it actually? Like, is that part of what you show people how to do is, is there a e-commerce platform or, or piece of this puzzle? Say that again, what is, what is the question? How do they, how do they charge for it? Do you, I mean, when people sign up or what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, we have two kinds of people uh, doing uh, these kind of shows. Uh, Dan White is doing um, a ticket show. So he, I don't know if it's around $120 to $150. Uh, the ticket, they send a box, which is this this box right here. So they send this box to, to people. And there is a lot of secrets inside. And they uh, run a show where um, they use the material that come in the box. So it's an incredible show. It goes beyond so, the limits that you think uh, the vertical can go. That's fascinating. It's you know, serious, interactive. Yeah. So so they're so they're it's about hundred. Let's say one hundred twenty dollars a a person. Up to a thousand people are signing up for this, and they're sent. Then they send them like a little box that has them, you know, play along with the show. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm showing right now the the website, uh, the magician online, and Mostly all the dates here are sold out, sold out there. Yeah, there is one here on the 11th. And yeah, when it says sold out, it means uh, that there's a thousand people that signed up for it or close to. Usually, right now, uh, the number has been 200. Uh, oh, he's limited to 200 for these. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He has done um, corporate shows at that number, but the show is limited to 200. Still like it. That's a <laughs> pretty good pretty good revenue for um, i'm just looking at that many sold out shows and doing the math in my head and just like yeah, that's a pretty yeah. good that's a pretty good uh, that, that's pretty yeah. good business uh it's but i and i think that's really Over important. 300 shows right now oh my gosh yeah and and so because i think that that's a really important people to see is that there's not it's not just that there's something that is um you know that's a real business it's not just that it's a cool thing to do but people are actually building a real business around it that's making real money you know and, and he's doing it pretty much all by himself or does he have a team uh, Dan White is one of the three members that have a team. He does some very complex stuff, so he, he does need a team. <laughs> but before that, um, before uh, using the, the tools that I have built, the, the, the guy that controlled his computer, he was, you couldn't, he couldn't breathe. It's so busy he was. It was. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, we have a big team here that does this. <laughs> so so I, I definitely agree. Uh, next question. 
Next one comes from James Haldane in Vancouver, Canada. Do your attendees and panelists join the same meeting or do you push the OBS feed to a second Zoom meeting for the audience to join? Yeah. Yeah, so so are they all in the same meeting or are they in different meetings there? So, uh, you know, in, in they're in the same meeting. In this, so it's the all happening meeting. in the same meeting. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, next question. JJ McKenna, San Rafael, back. Do you usually use the Office Hours logo as your placeholder? <laughs> I think that was always, always. <laughs> That's a good, good little, little, good little ad for our show. Nice plug. Uh, next question. Next question comes from Todd Rains in Allen, Texas. Is the purchase of a subscription needing annual payment, or is the software license perpetual after the first purchase? There is a, an annual membership for a fraction of the price because this is a, a program. So. You're getting a very intensive program in the first five weeks, which has to replace as well. And then um, the, there is a renewal for a fraction of their cost. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Next, can you talk about how you have adapted your class to the needs of different performers and educators? Because you're not uh, all, yeah, so the last time we talked, you were really focused heavily on magicians, but it sounds like you've branched out to a yeah. lot of other things now. Yeah, yeah. Um, magicians are very demanding in terms of timing and video and, um, you know, uh, production. Mm -hmm. They need everything to be as as perfect in time as possible. Educators doesn't need to be uh, that level. So one of the things that I did was simplifying the program. I have simplified the program in a way that people can get with a very short time invested, they can get to a... Um, to a place that they are really happy with. So they mm -hmm. can, every week they spend like two hours to three hours maximum to get to a very good place where they are confident and they have practiced. And that's why, how I have adapted. That's great. And adding these uh, special things as well, like the hands up queue for people to see in order who's going to get uh, entered next, these kind of things. Next question. Todd Rains in Allen, Texas wonders, can you show a five minute performance? Are you able to do anything for us so we can see how it actually runs in well, um, I think the uh, the kinds of things that I have showed you guys here, uh, which is bringing the, the gallery, right? We right. can uh, bring in the gallery if we want to, let's say, we want to call in a participant, but we want to do that in a little bit fun way. This is a wheel that is taking the names of the actual Zoom call. So uh, the participants hmm. that are on the call right now, they're here. I didn't have to prepare anything. It's like it's I dynamic. just joined the call, get it, and we can um, we can either force a participant, and we can add, uh, or we can. Um, and, and once it selects it, does it know where they are, so it can just go grab them? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah. Really cool. Let me show you from this scratch. <laughs> so I clear all pins, and then I I go to the effect. I'm going to do another one here. So yeah, I'm going to do the same one. So. For the participant, and this is my uh, backstage window. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anyone right now. So I can either force or I can click on random. I will click on random. It's going to select someone for me. Once this person is selected, these uh, they are going to be pinned in this box here automatically. So Glenn, they are pinned wow. and ready to go. So I just have to uh, hide the gallery and then I bring in my participant. That's really impressive. <laughs> That's great. That's really, really the cool. Same thing. There is another one that I can I can show mm -hmm. uh, too, which is the, there's another kind of uh, roulette where this, this one we can, let's say we can force. So I'm going to then choose someone else. Okay. So now I'm going to select someone to participate. And this is uh, to add a little bit of fun. You know, performers use it a lot and trainers and uh, people running uh, right. other kind of settings can use that too. And then you can bring them uh, up to the screen with you very hmm. easily. It's great. Really cool. Uh, next question. Next question comes to us from Matthias Hutila in Helsinki, Finland. He says, how fast can a user get into your using your system? For example, a beginner, how much training is needed before producing shows? Right, so everything that we do is very focused on the people that, the person that doesn't have 
career technical skills. I have not seen OBS and, you know, just getting started. So um, we built a lot of things that you can get off the ground real quick. For example, um, to get, um, bringing the participants like I was showing here to display the, the gallery around um, these kind of things they get with uh, within the, the first week. The first week they're doing these changing cameras as well. So the basic, for me, the basic stuff, which is not so basic, but showing gallery around, but bringing participants. And then um, it gets more uh, evolved with adding visual overlays and audio and everything. We had a lot of step-by-step -step guides. So we have both video material, but also written step-by-step -step so people can really go in and get up and running with this. But I would say um, within the first week, you're doing what I'm showing here. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What are the challenges you face in helping your performers? Is the largest challenge the technology or learning better presentation skills? Uh, I think everyone that joins the program have really good presentation skills uh, um, because they are performers, they are presenters, and they are very, they are just afraid of technology and they're uh, afraid of doing something that will make them feel, uh, look bad. Right. Right. So I don't I don't have any problems with the, the presentation part. Next question. Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh. Uh, what feedback have you received from your trainees? Are there any current improvement requests you're working on? Yes, all, all the time. Uh, actually, yesterday I was talking to Josh and he was helping me set the system out and he asked, hey, could you get clean images of these people, too? Because we um, right here. When I bring a spectator, it had the Zoom name because it's useful for performers. And but the same day yesterday, someone had also asked me to do that. So Josh asked, and I did this uh, yesterday, and I, I'm showing you guys here yeah. the the clean image is one. Yeah, but I get feedback all the time, especially yeah. when it comes to workflow. Uh, they tell me, oh, I I have difficulty to to find a spectator. This workflow here that I'm showing you guys the the with the gallery that you can. Um, the, the spectators with the avatars and they are ordered by if they have opened their mic or mic or not, mm -hmm. if they are ready to participate. Everything of, of these is our constant feedbacks that I'm getting from the group and I'm evolving put into the system. Next question. Joe Phillips in Murphy, North Carolina asked a kind of a user interface question. Is the user audio muted and unmuted with focus? So so oh, when you uh, bring them in, uh, does it open up their mic? Yeah. It doesn't open up their mic uh, automatically. It could be set up to, to do so, but because it's like the second screens, uh, people preload them with the spectators. So I think that they have to be ready to unmute when they are. But we do have something that um, allows them to unmute very quickly. Right here, uh, it's our, this is the mainstream deck that we use. And this is the button that pulls the participant in or out. And below this, you have spec, which means the, the folder that has spec controls. So I could unmute them by pressing this button. You're not going to see uh, him getting unmuted because I have a clean image, but if he had a mic appearing, he would be unmuted right or being requested to unmute. Next question. And you can control other things on, on the spectator too, on this folder. Yep. That's great. Next question comes from Todd Raines in Allen, Texas. Can you mention what you're doing later this week? You virtual audiences masterclass week. What can we expect in it? Yeah, so I'm running uh, in a few days the Virtual Audience Masterclass Week. Let me bring it up to show you guys. So this is going to be a hands-on uh, event where I'm going to uh, walk you through how to put together um, a production that you can run all by yourself, being the presenter, the performer, and making it feel engaging, engaging and make the audience part of the experience. So I'm going to share um, my best, my best uh, content on that. And after that, I'm going to open up the, for the last time the Roman Fraud Insider Show as well. This is going to be a free event. And what I'm going to share here is going to really be something valuable for everyone running trainings, masterclass that they will be able to apply right away. That's great. Um, next question. Cindy Drozda, Erie, Colorado, back again. Does purchase of your product include training and using OBS for someone who hasn't used it? Yes, yes. We, we do have the basic training, but even with OBS, even for someone that already knows OBS, I have created a system to control OBS as well. So I don't use the, the full OBS stream deck buttons. 
I used another system that is way more powerful that makes um, controlling multiple sources something very easy. So even for someone getting started, we have a, a initial um, um, onboarding week to, to show these things. And it's very impressive what people are able to do. Because oftentimes what happens is that people get so complex that they can't change it and they are right. confident to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Do you help educators in your program as well as performers? Yeah, we have a few professor, professors uh, in the program and uh, people running cohort courses as well. So, and there is a lot of educators uh, signed in to the masterclass. So uh, there will be uh, some special things for educators there. It's really great because I think that a lot of times we have to, you know, educators have been challenged obviously through COVID, but I think that now, there's a new reality, whether you're an educator or at all levels, from corporate all the way down to, to our, you know, uh, elementary school of more and more is moving online and they have to, and right now they have to figure out how to do it inside of a pretty small box. And so being able to learn how to do this seems like a, and do you have, do you do any programs um, that are, and we put, by the way, um, the, there's the link, <laughs> there's a, there's a link to the, uh, to that's your, to your YouTube page. That, yeah, I know that's the link for the YouTube, but that's the, the YouTube link to my masterclass. Oh, that's perfect. And we put the we put the link also into the email that goes out to our members, and so so that's all that's been uh, that's been sent out. So if you, you look at the email there, and you'll find that for the masterclass, uh, it's really really interesting because I think that again, um, people ha we have to start, and that's what we're doing a lot with office hours and with other things of how do we push this envelope and and really create something beyond um, a, a standard uh, virtual conference. So. Uh, it's just and that's really, amazing what you guys have, uh, what, where you guys were and where you are right now. This is simply amazing. Yeah, it's, it's fun. And we're having a great, I mean, it's incredible, but it takes a small bill. It's not a one person thing right now. It takes a small bill. Yes. So we're, we're working on, we're, we're whittling, whittling some of that down. Um, next question. Uh, another one from Douglas Carmichael. This simple question. How do you develop with the Stream Deck software development kit? With extremely difficulty. <laughs> but I... <laughs> I figured that I had to make a decision. Uh, Companion would be easier for me, but the, the performers and presenters that I was dealing with uh, have the tech as one of the problems. So I figured I will do, deal with the tech and call yeah. difficulties so that they can be having this time. That makes sense. Uh, next question. I'm Matthias Dutio is back from Helsinki, Finland. Is there a way to add text on top of the video like lower thirds, for example, displaying specific bullet points and so forth? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you can do that on OBS. And uh, I just recently did a um, masterclass showing how to bring in slides to the screen. Just um, let me do an example of that. So one of the things that I, I like a lot uh, for doing, for teaching, Is this kind of slide here? So it's that a little bit sense. angled, and you can mm -hmm. come in and come and go whenever you want. So you can keep uh, them focusing on what you're saying. And then when you, whenever you want, without uh, leaving your eyes from the camera, you can bring it to the top. You can go to the next slide. So we teach how to do uh, this kind of productions uh, in the program too. Next question. Oh, next, yeah. next question. Yeah. Go ahead. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. How often do you host your master class? And if we can't make this upcoming course, when will your next course be? So I open it twice a year. This uh, last time I opened was about four months ago because I stayed six months developing my system from scratch to not use the one I see or anything. And I opened it four months ago and I'm going to open it uh, in a few weeks after the masterclass. I, I like to work with the group. I don't want to onboard a large group, usually uh, 30 to 40 members join. So a small group of people and I like to spend the time. I have the five weeks. Uh, first week dedicated to getting up and running. But again, first week they get uh, a lot of, out of the program and most people don't even need to, to go beyond uh, if they don't want to. But I like to spend time with the group doing additional workshops and brainstorm sessions so that we can evolve the product and then we can open it again. So I don't know when I'm opening it uh, next year yet. That's great. Um, next question. Josh Kaufman again. Um, yeah, from Pittsburgh saying, what is the commitment you ask from your students to learn in your master class? Uh, and he's specifically interested in what kind of practice, attendance, and so forth is required. 
Perfect. So uh, the way that it's structured is that every Monday we have a live group coaching with me where I introduce uh, one of the aspects of conducing a virtual audience experience. And we have replaced for those who can't attend. And everything that I explain in the live uh, coaching session, we also have a step-by-step -step guides. So if you just attend the live sessions, or even if you don't see the replay and you go straight to the step-by-step, -step, depending on how tech savvy you are, you might wanna, uh, you might be able to just go to the step-by-step -step and get up and running real quick. But we designed the program to have uh, an investment of two hours to three hours per week to do a, a big improvement and aside from that, we have track sessions as well, where uh, we have other team experts that work with you and put on you on spotlight and ask you to do some tasks so that you can get confident with using the system in a setting that is not a, a real world uh, setting. Felipe, so, thank you so much for your time. It's really impressive. Like of it's course. Just, uh, you've come a long so way since the last time we saw you here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so um, it's, it's really impressive. And I, and I just love how much you're pushing that outer envelope and really showing us what we can be doing online, you know, and we don't have to be limited to, you know, just, just opening up an app and, and running it. And we're, we're doing some of that on our end in one way. Um, and you're taking it, uh, you know, you just really, I love the, the interaction because we're getting to a point and I really believe this, that we're going to get to a point where the virtual experience is in many ways better than the physical one would be. And I think that you're one of those folks that's really showing us that future, you know, right now, you know, and just we're seeing glimpses of it. So it's just super impressive. So thank you for joining us again. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to have you guys today. Thank you, guys. Thank bye you. Bye. And thanks to our producers uh, for all the great questions. We were so close to a record. We, we hit 66, 67 is the <laughs> number of questions. It's a record. We were so close. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, thank you so much for all the great questions. Just a, a barrage of questions from our producers and, and a really, really well. Great conversation, as always, from all of you. Um, thanks to our panelists for the first hour and second hour. I can't do this without you. And thank you to our uh, incredible team on the back end that makes this happen seven days a week. Seven days a week. We haven't missed a day. Nine hundred and I don't know how many. Um, and uh, so, so really, just incredible work. And, and we, we're on the new system. If you guys didn't see that yesterday, we we or on Sunday we just discussed it. All the hardware got moved from a smaller shell to a bigger shell, um, and uh, seamlessly. So thanks to everyone who worked on that and made sure that every, everything's working forward as we move to two point five. So um, so anyway, thanks to everybody there. And now. We're going to go in, remember in after hours, in four minutes, we're going to be watching the product, um, uh, uh, the product keynote, which is very important to me that you watch the product keynote, <laughs> we'll just say, uh, uh, for, for Zoom and Zoomtopia. So, so definitely uh, check that out. I'm going to be going in there. I'm going to run out and get a coffee and then I'm going to run back in here and, and sit down and, and we'll watch it together. So we'll see you in after hours. Nice job. So, Felipe, this is our quiet room. We just kind of talk about the show until we run out of credits. But I can't believe grabbing the, 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 the thing that for me was the dial that goes around. The and dial was like, awesome. And then it grabs the person. I was like, oh, like, I can't believe it did that. So, it's uh, anyway, pretty impressive. So, that's so I love the fluidness of the whole thing. So, anyway, but uh, excited. I'm excited about the product keynote.